Welcome back into the Illini Enquirer podcast. And things aren't going well for Illinois football right now after back-to-back losses. But Maryland football feeling pretty good with a familiar name uh, leading the program to Illinois fans. And that's Mike Loxley and his Terps off to a 2-0 start after uh, a COVID-ravaged year that uh, had three games canceled last year. But they did have two wins uh, against Minnesota and Penn State that were pretty impressive. Let's get the lowdown on Mike Loxley's Terrapins from Jeff Ehrman from Inside MD Sports, one of our fine publishers at 24-7 Sports. A 2-0 start, I know one of those is against Howard, but one win uh, against uh, West Virginia is a huge one on the road. Uh, How are things feeling uh, out there in College Park, Jeff? Uh, There's a lot of excitement. I mean, more than there has been certainly around Maryland football in years when you look at the way the past few years have gone, both on and off the field. You know, they haven't been to a bowl game since 2016. You had the DJ Durkin saga, the Jordan McNair tragedy. So it's been a you know, a steady rebuild for the past four years or so to get to this point where there's actually some more positivity, more excitement. And, you know, they've, like you said, they've only played one real team, but they've looked pretty good so far. Yeah, and I think we and I, you and I were talking before this, like Maryland and Illinois are both basketball schools. Like the fan bases care about basketball. So um, what what is the fan base like with football and, and how has Locks um, excited that fan base so far? You know, he's starting to get them back out. The first few years, it was impossible. Nobody could have gotten them back out. They had gone through so much off the field. The team wasn't good. And like you said, it's not a, it's not one of those football fan bases where you're going to get 80,000 or however many people in the stands, no matter how good they are, Nebraska or Penn State or wherever else. So uh, the, the students have really come out strong the first few games. I, my theory there is that they, you know, they've been cooped up so long because of COVID that they, they're just happy to be able to do anything. So I I think that's actually helping a lot, but also it's an exciting product. They're putting up, uh, putting up pretty big numbers, and, and people love Mike Loxley. You know, he is a Maryland guy. You know, Randy Edsel before him when he took the job, he said it was his, his dream job, and everybody knew that was garbage. He's a Pennsylvania guy. His dream job was Penn State, I'm sure. Uh, Loxley said it, and he means it. He's a Maryland guy through and through. This is his third guy, third, excuse me. Uh, third stint at the program is where he wants to be. And he's, he's, he's really likable. So, um, you know, he's got the fans on board now. He just needs to keep winning. Obviously locks has some offensive chops. You know, we saw what he did at Alabama with some of the best talent in the country, but we also saw what he did at Illinois to get some of the best talent, uh, to a place that hadn't been getting it in Illinois. And then to lead, you know, juice Williams, Richard Mendenhall, Regis Ben. Uh, to a Rose Bowl, and and that was an exciting, exciting time for Illinois football. He seems to be doing something similar at Maryland, you know, not not a place that always kills it in recruiting, but three straight pretty good classes there, Jeff. Like, why is Locks resonating? How is he getting uh, a really talented roster? How has he put that together there? Well, I mean, as you know very well, he's always been a great recruiter. He's a natural his, his line that he uses often is if people like you, they're going to buy from you. And so and people like him. He's genuine. He's not one of these coaches who spouts off a bunch of cliches. He's just a normal guy when you talk to him, very forthcoming, friendly. And then he knows everybody. You know, he's kind of the godfather of the DFB. He's a local guy from D.C., has been in the area, you know, recruiting the area forever. He just knows every, literally everybody. So this year's class was, this, this current freshman class was ranked uh, number 18 in the country, which is the highest Maryland's had in uh, decades. And so some of those guys are staying in the field, but he's also the past few classes, while not highly as highly rated, he got a lot of really good players who are now starting to become those guys who are on the field. Yeah, so um, what has he learned? I mean, obviously his first head coaching stint did not go well uh, at, at New Mexico, both on and off the field. H- how has he matured? Like, how did the whole – in first Maryland experience as OC there. And then obviously the Nick Saban seems like career defining, um, you know, wherever people go there, it seems like they come out uh, for the better. Like how did that all impact him? Um, I think he'll tell you, he shouldn't have taken that job. He was too young. It's a very tough job. So he's, you know, he's actually, he said that to me, like it was, he knows that that's on his record and people will always doubt him because of, you know, what was pretty disastrous run there. Uh, I think he learned a lot from Saban in terms of the process, being organized, getting a little bit better every day. Uh, he's gotten a little more strict 
and controlled with how he runs things. And so, you know, uh, he's a different guy. You know, everybody, when you're younger and you're at your first head coaching job, you know, I think, I don't remember how long, I think he was late thirties at that point. So he wasn't as young as some of these guys today, but he was on the younger side. Uh, so he's, I think he's basically just matured and, you know, he is who he is. And, um, and like he said, everybody who sprinkles, who Saban sprinkles that dust on, you know, for the most part, they seem to come out better. And I think he, he really learned a lot from Saban. Uh, okay, so let's start with the quarterback. That's the first thing you got to fix usually in a program. Illinois is still trying to fix that. Uh, but he he gets a guy he knew at Alabama, Talea Tungavailoa. Last year had some interception problems, but we saw in the two wins, boy, he can he can be good. Um, two great games to start this season. What kind of growth have you seen out of him? Because, I mean, his numbers right now are some of the best in the Big Ten. Uh, again, just one game against a Power 5 opponent. But what have you seen from him so far? Uh, he looks more decisive. I mean, he spent the whole summer. He's a, you know, like his brother, his, his father raised champions. That was his whole thing. He, he's one of those quarterback dads who, you know, he's going to raise some thoroughbred guys who are just focused on the game. He, he's not on social media at all. Um, so some people say that, but he actually lives that student of football thing. So he looks more decisive. Uh, he's not making the forced throws so far. Last year, he had a tendency to make forced throws and had seven picks in four games because of it. He hasn't done that so far. And uh, he actually looks a little bit quicker too back there. I mean, he's, there's been several times in the first two games where there was a pretty good rush and he's danced around for three or four seconds and then found somebody on the run uh, and dropped a dime. So, you know, he's looked really good, but, you know, I think he, we need to save some of the praise until he does it against some big 10 team. Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, he does. I, I think Illinois fans should be very concerned, given what Virginia just did to them, uh, because Virginia has talented weapons, but but so does Maryland. Um, how good is this receiver crew, and and what makes them so good? I think it's arguably the second best in the Big Ten behind Ohio State. Um, you know, Dante Demas and Rakim Jarrett. It's hard to find a combo better than those two guys. And then I saw Pro Football Focus posted today that Maryland's the only two only school to have two receivers I think in their top 80 or whatever but the other guy was not Demas it was actually Jay Sean Jones and Jarrett so so Jones is pretty good they got a few other guys who are good and you know it's the deepest receiver core they've had in a while and those first two guys Demas and, and Jarrett are big player receivers now, how does their run game play off that? Uh, you know, Floyd Davis seems like he's having a pretty good start. Uh, offensive line, um, how good are they? Offensive line was the biggest question coming into the season. They had some new guys. They had some shifting. Not much depth behind those guys. But through two games, they've been really good. You know, we'll see if that, again, see if that holds up. Howard, they had a huge advantage, size advantage. West Virginia, we don't know how good they are yet. Um, but they've looked better than expected. Fleet Davis was kind of an unproven guy. He's, he's had a solid career, but unproven in terms of being a number one back. I think he averaged like about 4.2 yards per carry coming into this season. Uh, he's looked those, he's looked pretty good so far, but I think you could plug almost anybody in there and look pretty good, you know, when you have those weapons at receiver and it's creating some room for you to run. Uh, they have a couple other guys behind him who look good at times, but it's you know, it's going to be somewhat of a running back by committee situation because he's not necessarily that Jake Funk who got drafted last year or Ty Johnson or Anthony McFarlane or all these really fast guys who went to the NFL for the past few years. He's more of a uh, Swiss Army Knights kind of guy. I think every Illinois fan is doesn't have any faith in its defense after the last two games, Jeff. So if they're going to exploit, like what, what would be the weakness of Maryland or, or how can Illinois – keep them in check if possible i think the interior is probably maryland's weakest spot they have eric harris a junior college guy uh playing his first major college action he's held up so far but he's kind of been rushed into the role uh and then they've got some inexperience elsewhere at the guard mason lunsford on the left side is starting his first year uh, maryland's pretty good at the tackles they haven't allowed much of a pass rush uh but you know it's really hard to say where their weakness is again because Howard was a scrimmage and and so they only have one game really to go on but uh I would say the interior of the line you know that that would be the one area that I still want to see them hold up against a, another real team 
And obviously, if you pressure Tunga Bailoa, if you're able to get to him, you see if maybe he makes some of those bad throws that he was prone to making last year. All right, let's switch to the defensive side of the ball, Jeff. Um, this is an area I know Maryland has struggled in the past. Um, how have they improved um, early this season? Again, we, we only know this, the guys they've played, but holding West Virginia, any West Virginia team to 24 points is pretty good in a win. Uh, and then to, to shut out a team, even if it's an FCS, bad FCS team, uh, you still shut them out. So what, what kind of growth have you seen there? Yeah, it's funny. Going into the season, everybody talked about the wide receivers, but when I did a story ranking their – positional units best to worst uh you know it's hard not to put the corner or excuse me the defensive backs in that top spot they have a really good defensive backfield uh jacorian bennett a cornerback who was a junior college recruit last year has been really good he has interceptions in both games including one uh, to seal the west virginia win uh, they've got another name deontay banks and another name target still who was a freshman all-american last year and then at safety, you've got Nick Cross, who was a you know a big time recruit, NFL prospect kind of guy, really big hitter. Uh, so I think the secondary, you know, last year the defensive, the uh, pass defense got much better because of these guys, but nobody really noticed because it was a short season. Uh, I think they've continued that this year. So I think the pass coverage is really good. And now the defensive line, uh, they've got more depth than they've had depth and size than they've had in several years. So it, it's just an overall talent upgrade defensively yeah i know you said in your our know the foe feature that that linebacker could be the one issue for them because they're pretty young there right and illinois does have uh some some good running backs a solid offensive line so what would be the concern there what could illinois attack there yeah i mean they, they do have an experienced guys they have brandon jennings starting in the middle uh, he's a true freshman from florida four-star big he doesn't look like a freshman a big kid but he's also uh, very inexperienced. And then on the outside, they, you know, they at times have been prone to give up a little bit on the outside. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't call it a weakness necessarily, but if there's a spot where they don't have proven guys, it's definitely a linebacker, Ruben Hippolyte, uh, arguably kind of the quarterback of their defense. He's only a sophomore who played just a little bit last year. So that's, that would be the spot where they're unproven. Maryland's receiving votes in the AP poll. Uh, they had the chance to go three and zero for the first time, I think, since 2016. What's this? What's this game mean for them? Their Big Ten opener. This is a huge game for them. This is really a huge game for them because if they win this, they have a chance to get to four and zero going into the Iowa game. And then, you know, you're kind of in that house money situation. Like, we win this, it's a whole different kind of season. Like, it's no longer like let's rebuild and just try to maybe get a bowl game. Uh, so, you know. Because I should explain, because they have Kent State after Illinois, so obviously they should beat Kent State. So this is one where you really can get the fans on the bandwagon, get the excitement going. You lose this, and things kind of sputter, and the excitement really, I think, uh, takes a big hit. So for them, this is an enormous swing game kind of situation. Yeah, and of course for Illinois, they're trying to get to two and zero in the Big Ten, even though they've lost the the last two. So maybe they can uh, kind of turn around their early season here. Um, what what do you think is the potential of of this year, Jeff? Say they they do get a win and they get to four and zero, like um, in the Big Ten East, we know that's such a bear. But um, how how good can this team be this year? Do you think? I think they could be if things go well, a seven or eight win team. You know, you win this, get off the four and zero, you win. Some of those 50-50 kind of games heading down, you know, some of the teams might not be as good as they once looked, like Indiana, for instance. Um, you know, you beat Rutgers, and, and then all of a sudden you're seven or eight. You know, the win total for them going, the betting total going into the season was five and a half. Uh, I think if you get to a bowl game, people will be happy. But, you know, with the talent they have, if the offensive line can hold on, can can hold off, if Tunga Bailoa keeps playing like he has, you know, there's there's a chance for it to be – one of their better seasons in recent years which really isn't that high of a benchmark, if we're being honest. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Maryland gets the same term, but everyone calls Illinois a sleeping giant. and no, all the time. <laughs> and I just go, well, they're just sleeping if they if they never live up to that. What do you think is yeah. the potential? Like, what, what do you think is a realistic goal for Maryland football in the Big Ten? Well, first, that's funny because I have said your exact answer to so many people, radio interviews, whatever. I think they're a sleeping giant, but I say yes. They the potential is there, but if you if you don't if you're never living up to it, you're just you're sleeping. There's no you know 
anybody could be a sleeping giant. But, um, you know, I think the potential is to be like a Michigan State kind of program where you win eight, eight and a half, eight, eight games maybe per year, something like that. You know, obviously you never know. But as you know, it's so hard to get to that next Ohio State, more so in football, basketball, people can, you know, schools can come up and do that at least for a few years. In football, it's so much harder, especially in the Big Ten East. But, you know, if you could get that Michigan State level where you're winning between seven and nine a year, and then once every four or five years, you have that huge breakout 10-win season, I think they're capable. I mean, the sleep people do say sleeping giant for a reason. There's a great recruiting hotbed around them. They've now got a brand new and amazing indoor facility. Uh, their coaches, who are obviously biased, believe it's the best in the country. And so, you know, th there is definitely potential there to be a pretty good program. All right, Jeff, before I let you go, uh, I do want to ask, Illinois basketball had such a crazy offseason. I think everyone has a crazy offseason now. But but Maryland basketball, it felt like had just this roller coaster of, oh, this this is all coming in, but these guys are going out at the end of it. What do you think of the the roster um, that, that Maryland basketball and Mark Turgeon have settled on here? I think it's pretty good. You know, I think it's one of the deepest rosters yet. We'll see if it has those, you know, top two scorers. Uh, it has one, I think, Eric Ayala. I think he's going to be a 18-point-per-game kind of guy this year. He's going to move uh, from the one to the two. That's Russell, the transfer from Rhode Island. will play the one now. They got Caduce Wahab. Uh, the 6'10", 6'11", center from Georgetown. It was one of the top transfers in the country. I really like Dante Scott. I think people, he's underappreciated uh, as a forward. I think he'll become, a, you know, a borderline star this year. So they've got, and they've got a deeper bench than they've had the past few years. So I think, you know, if things work out, it's got the potential to be one of his best teams. It feels like Mark Turgeon, like nobody's been happy there about, about what he's done despite him. Notice that. Yeah, yeah, I have. And when I went to D.C. for the uh, the Big Ten tournament, people were talking about like Mark Turgeon, like he's not doing all that well, even though he's finishing atop the Big Ten. And even in his down years, he's making the tournament. So what is that relationship been like? Why why is Turge not like beloved there? Because uh, people, March Madness, you know, people want a deep tourney run and he has not, he hasn't made one. Yeah. You know, he's done a solid job over, overall generally finished in the top four of the Big Ten, recruited pretty well. Um, but there's been, you know, one sweet 16, and it wasn't even a really satisfying one. It was one where they beat Hawaii and South Dakota State and then lost in a borderline blowout to Kansas. So, you know, they, people live for March Madness and, and, and the Big Ten tournament, and you know, that just hasn't happened for them. So I think after what they saw Gary Williams do and realized that the program was capable, you know, he's going to Sweet 16 every year, then finally got to the Final Four, and then the next year won it all. They, they got a taste of that, and they want more, and that just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, understandable. It's, it's tough to replace a legend, and yes, um, Illinois fans know that, you know, a uh, single elimination tournament can be pretty cruel at times. Uh, even Miller Bates, the two programs have had pretty similar uh, profiles. Uh, well, uh, say hey to, to Locks and the Zucker for us. We're, we're happy to see them back in, in Champaign. I think people uh, think even fonder of what they've done uh, since they those guys mm -hmm. left because it's been so difficult to, uh, to get back to that. But Jeff Herman, Inside MD Sports. Jeff, appreciate the time as always, man. Thanks for having me, Jerry. Appreciate it.